Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to what for us is a really special uh, boundary-breaking science lecture. Uh, the reason today's event is so special is not just because we've got a fantastic speaker with us, Professor Connor Coley, coming over from MIT in the, the US, but for the first time in two years, we're actually able to be here in person in a lecture hall and host an in-person event. My name is Carl Collins, and I'm responsible for the scientific portfolio of the Bio Foundation. And I'm really happy to be able to welcome everyone to what is really a fantastic location here in the heart of Berlin. We have uh, the research campus from Bayer, and today we're joined by scientists, yes, from Bayer, but also our partners, Nuvisan. We've invited our friends and colleagues from the universities of Berlin as well. And on top of that, and welcome to all of you online, uh, this is a really important aspect of what we are doing today. I think if you bear with me a moment just to explain a little bit why it's so important for us making science accessible to a wider community. At Bio Foundation, we focus our actions in three key areas. This is equity, collaboration, and trust in science. And when we talk about equity, in science, for us, a lot of it is about access to science. And we here in this room, we're very privileged. We are either associated with top universities or major research organizations. And we take for granted having fantastic speakers come and talk to us about science. We have access to all the scientific literature, mostly that we could want. It's very important to remember that that's not the case for everybody. And if you look, there are fantastic researchers around the world that are simply not able to do their work because they don't have as much access to really cutting edge and contemporary science as we do. For that reason, we not only make our lectures available online, and you can go to the Bio Foundation website and find a whole host of different lectures from the last couple of years, really exciting science, but for the first time today, we really opened the live lecture to everyone around the world that wants to join us. So a big welcome to all of you online. And this is really with the intention of just doing a small bit to try and increase access globally to some of the most exciting science there is out there. Now, with that, I'd like to hand over to Rob uh, Webster. So he's a group leader here in Berlin uh, in medicinal chemistry. And uh, Rob's done a great job supporting us today, entertaining Connor, introducing him to the scientists of the company. And uh, Rob will introduce today's very special guest. Thank you, Carl. Great. Welcome, everyone. Thanks. I'm Rob Webster. I'm a department head, medicinal chemist, and automation enthusiast, and it's my great pleasure and honor today to introduce Professor Connor Colley and to have organized his visit today. So we've gotten colleagues from different buyer sites to join us, participate in scientific meetings, and uh, are very happy that this could come to fruition. So Connor has had a very meteoric rise in his career. Um, as a medicinal chemist, I am a firm believer in AI, machine learning, and uh, digital tools applied to chemistry. So I'm very happy to have someone like Connor, who's obviously very bright and talented in this field, um, fighting for us and pushing um, scientific frontiers in this arena. So to introduce Connor, he has a bachelor's in chemical engineering from Cal uh, Caltech, completed his PhD in chemical engineering from MIT. And uh, at this point, I was already aware of him as a PhD student due to the involvement in a machine learning consortium. I think it was the Machine Learning for Pharmaceutical Discovery and Synthesis. Connor's nodding. I got the acronym correct. Excellent. <laughs> it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, so being aware of someone this early in their career uh, as an industrial chemist is, is truly an exception. Um, Connor went on to do a postdoc at the Broad Institute in the area of uh, DNA, DNA encoded libraries. I, uh, was surprised to learn today, but that um, I think is really showing a well-rounded interest in, in um, the pharmaceutical industry and, and technologies, and uh, went on to become a professor at MIT in chemical engineering in 2020, right at the start of the corona pandemic. Uh, I believe it was in July, he told me today. So <laughs> with that uh, short time in his career, he's already received many uh, accolades, quite a bit of recognition, numerous awards, which uh, despite the short career, I don't have time to list. Uh, namely, let's see if I can remember a few of them. So you were named uh, the CNN um, Talented 12. That's one I can remember. Um, Forbes magazine, I think 30 under 30 in healthcare. Uh, there was uh, the NSF Career Award. That's an important one, 2021. And of course, now the uh, Bayer Award for uh, Early Excellence in Chemistry. So please, Connor, stage is yours. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much, Rob, and thanks um, 
for the, the invitation to sort of come back here in person and, and share some of the work that we are doing in the group. Um, so it's really a pleasure to have the chance to share um, what it is we do with, with such a wide audience, um, again, also including people online. Um, and what, what we do really is sort of at this interface of chemistry, data science, machine learning, as well as engineering and automation. So if I move ahead. Um, what we're gonna be talking about today um, is AI, artificial intelligence, as it applies to chemical space navigation and synthesis. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about molecular design, how we think about designing new small molecules and how that ties into our other approaches to predict the synthesis of those compounds. And so I wanna start off first by acknowledging the fact that most of what I'll tell you about today, of course, was not directly done by myself, but of course done by very talented uh, students, postdocs, and collaborators, um, some of whom you see on the slide here. And of course, I have to acknowledge also our funding supports um, as well. Excellent. So to start off, I'm gonna be a little bit philosophical maybe and just say that when I think about therapeutic discovery, I really think of it as a search. Okay, so I think about the way that we can approach these problems with algorithms. And so one thing we have to do is first define the space within which we want to search. So depending on you know, what modality you think about, we'll have different chemical spaces. So of course, small molecules exist in some small molecule chemical space, which people estimate to be you know, 10 to the 20, 10 to the 60, 10 to the 80, right? Once you get that large, it's fairly meaningless, right? It's a very, very vast combinatorial space. But if you also think about other modalities and other types of compounds moving sort of up the, the size here, right? So macrocycles, bifunctionals, right? We're getting to larger compounds, but these are still compounds that exist in a very large chemical space. You know, peptides exist as combinations of natural and non-natural amino acids. Of course, antibodies and uh, antibody drug conjugates sort of just expand this space further. And so really no matter which modality you're thinking about, um, you can think about these as, as a search problem. Now, sort of one of the main questions that we have to ask ourselves when we approach this uh, therapeutic discovery challenge is, well, how do we define these spaces, right? So how do we define this, this search space if we want to then use computational assistance to help us find the best solution from that space? And so one of the approaches that we take um, is by doing what's known as virtual screening. Right, so you can imagine having these vast libraries of hypothetical molecules and reformulating the problem of therapeutic discovery to one that's really just asking what is the best compound from this list of candidates. So this is defining a finite search space. We list all of the molecules that we want to be able to search, and then we want to evaluate each of them right, and figure out what the best one is. Okay, that's one, one way of thinking about this discovery task. The other way that people have started thinking about this increasingly is through the use of generative modeling. And so generative models right, are the same things that you see generating you know, image captions, doing machine translation, making up big celebrity faces. Um, they can be retooled and repurposed for chemistry. They can propose chemical structures. And so people have been very excited about these generative models because in principle you can search an infinite chemical space. Right? They're less constrained by what we know and what we list out. And so we can define these really, really large search spaces and rely or try to rely on machine learning to help us find the best one. Now people also call these models sort of inverse design models because you can think of it as not just going from structure to function, but taking that relationship and directly proposing the structure that we think achieves some optimal function. Okay, so it's inverting the problem of property prediction. So we're gonna talk about each of these in turn with a focus on generative models, but first to talk about screening a bit, you know, if we have these libraries of billions and billions of possible molecules we can make, we know we're not gonna run billions of experiments, and we're probably not gonna run billions of simulations either. And so in this regime, we often turn to surrogate models to help us. So we think about, um, in the machine learning space, using things like neural networks to learn complex relationships between inputs and outputs. And molecular structure and molecular function is a really good example of that kind of complex input-output mapping where we might not be able to write down you know, the exact equations that say how you go from a structure to some property like a biological activity, but we have labeled examples from which we can try to learn. And so when we think about using surrogate models for chemistry, there's sort of two main flavors we can think about. We can think about trying to train them on experimental data, where again, maybe we have a list of molecules and biological activities, and what we're trying to do is predicts the biological activity of a molecule for which we have not run the experiments. Right, so we're generalizing in molecular space 
to try to save the cost, essentially, of the experiments, predict what the answer will be. And we can also think about training these models on simulated data. And so this is maybe a little bit counterintuitive because you might ask if we can simulate it, what's the point? But if we train models on simulated data, we might be able to essentially recapitulate the answer of the simulations much more quickly. So what we can do is we could run you know, DFT on some compounds. Maybe it will take several hours, depending on the size and um, all of our assumptions. But if we train a machine learning surrogate, we might be able to get the same answer about the electronic structure in a matter of milliseconds. And so training these machine learning models on simulated data really lets us accelerate the process and maybe simulate more systems or larger systems. Now, one of the simulated sort of examples that we've done some work with recently is docking in the context of structure-based drug design. Now, docking is, is a very imperfect way right, of approximating the affinity between some number of candidate ligands and a protein of interest. And the typical way that people have been using docking is brute force screening. Right? You have a library of potential ligands, you have the protein you care about, and you try to evaluate all of them. Now, the sizes of these libraries, again, they're growing. People are doing these screens with hundreds of millions or sometimes billions of compounds. And docking is cheap, but it's not that cheap. And so what we asked a couple of years ago was essentially, can we just insert into this process a model? Right, so can we say, well, let's not dock everything. Let's not spend you know, the few CPU seconds per compound it takes to do the real docking calculation. Let's instead dock some compounds, train a surrogate model, and use that surrogate machine learning model to predict the results of the other simulation that we have not yet run. Okay, so we're not making docking more accurate, but what we're doing is we're using a model to basically circumvent the calculation, and in principle, it can run faster. And so this is a very simple way of inserting a model into the virtual screening workflow. We sort of expected that it would work well, but we didn't know how well it would work. And so what we're seeing on the right-hand side now is um, plotting the sort of fraction of the best compounds we find, or the percentage of the top 50,000 out of a set of 100 million candidate structures, and on the x-axis, what we see is that the uh, number of ligands explored is in the couple of percents. Okay, so we're only exploring up to 2.5 million ligands, but we're still finding about 90% of the best compounds. And so this is a very simple way to almost for free, right, save a factor of 40 in computational cost when it comes to these simulations and still arrive at more or less the right answer because docking really just gets you in the right ballpark. You don't rely on it that precisely, and so using the surrogate to sort of nudge you in the right direction and tell you what molecules are worth docking and which ones aren't is a, a very simple way of saving some cost. And so we're continuing to apply this a bit in the virtual screening setting. But if you come back to these sort of two views, right, we also have now generative modeling to worry about. And there's, there's a lot more questions that generative modeling raises, I think, than questions that it answers. So with these types of approaches, we're trying to directly propose the structures that we think will exhibit good properties. We're coming up with brand new designs that have never been made before. And often we're doing this computation where we're telling these models optimize this black box function for me. We're giving them some sort of in silico evaluation that tells it how good a molecule is and it's trying to find the best molecule for that purpose. And so you have this sort of classic, sort of now virtual design cycle where maybe a generator is gonna propose new molecules that get evaluated, you turn through that cycle, maybe tens of thousands of times or hundreds of thousands of times, and eventually you might spit out a compound that it believes um, maximizes that. Now the issue is that when you use these generative models, they're, they're optimizers, right, at, at the end of the day. They're optimizing some function. And so if you don't tell it about stability, and if you don't tell it about synthesizability, it might find optima that look absurd. Right? So it might find these structures that don't really make much sense. They don't violate chemical valence rules. So our computers are happy to parse them and they'll say, yes, these are, these are valid structures. But of course, you don't give these to chemists, you don't give them to a robotic platform and say, well, please make this compound for me. Right? These should not make it through sort of any initial stages of filtering. And so these you know, top examples are pretty egregious as far as compounds that you would never want to tell your chemist friends to make. Um, the ones on the bottom are a little bit more subtle, right? There's sort of this you know, full spectrum of things that look maybe okay, but are hard to synthesize versus easy to synthesize. 
But that's really what, what it's about. It's about whether we can take these recommendations from these generative models and actually test them. And so for me, because I'm interested in sort of autonomous discovery and thinking about ways to close the loop, eventually I want these designs to be tested automatically. And so I need to know which of these molecules, if any, are viable enough to pass on to testing. And so that sort of brings us back to this question of synthesis, which is a major effort of things we do in the group, um, because chemical synthesis is really a necessary part of the discovery process, right? It's a bottleneck, it's a middle stage, you, you can't uh, forego experimental testing. And so essentially, what, you know, if we're doing virtual libraries, we still have to worry about synthesis because that's often how we define these libraries. We enumerate possible products we can make based on reactions we know how to run and building blocks we have in stock. And for generative models, we have to take the recommendations that have never been seen or reported before, and we have to judge, or at least predict, which ones can we make and which ones can we not make. And so this then sort of brings us into the next sort of chapter of this talk about synthesis. And we're gonna think about synthesis planning so that we can take any of these recommendations and think about deciding whether or not they're good suggestions to move on to the testing phase of, of our design cycle. So for synthesis planning, um, the task depends on who you talk to, right? By that I mean what we actually want to be able to predict is going to depend on the use case. So when you talk to discovery chemists, their expectations of synthesis planning programs is that they have some notion of what building blocks to use, what reaction types to use, sort of how to stitch them together, loosely speaking. And most discovery chemists are, are happy to do their own condition screening, they're happy to fill in the blanks, um, but once you move into sort of process chemistry, the types of considerations that you need to make are different, right? The goal really isn't just trying to get that physical compound produced as quickly and efficiently as possible. It's trying to worry now about the uh, sort of performance of the routes, right? The yields, the selectivity, the cost, right? You start to worry a lot more about these more complex considerations. And so when I think about now designing algorithms to help in this process, we can think of this in different stages. So, you know, we can start with our target molecule of interest. We can do that first step of retrosynthetic analysis. We can plan out that sort of basic recipe in that synthetic tree that connects our target to building blocks that we can purchase. Sort of from there, we can think about filling in the details. So maybe for each reaction step, we don't just worry about the starting materials, but we think about the conditions. We think about what additives will be used, maybe what solvent will be used, and as we move up in this sort of level of sophistication, we're going to build in more and more considerations and layer, layer in these additional considerations. So filling in detail is sort of as we go from left to right, you know, if we keep going right off of the slide, we might get to purifications and other aspects. But here we're gonna leave synthesis planning as, as these sort of stages of elaboration. And I will also mention, again, because sort of automation is of high interest, um, if you're using autonomous laboratories, you of course can't leave any blanks, right? You have to tell them exactly what process to run. You have to tell your robot the orders of addition, the rates of addition. And so all of these additional details far beyond what's on the slide have to be specified. Okay, so the, the demands get sort of a lot higher as we move closer to automation. Now we're gonna start off just with retrosynthesis. Um, it's the easiest in, in some ways. And so for retrosynthesis, one of the natural approaches that have been taken over the years, um, and really this is an approach that dates back to uh, the 50s, um, is to try to codify the rules of chemistry. And so in this case, you know, the rules of chemistry, we often think about in terms of these templated transformations. So what reactions are possible? We sort of define these patterns. Maybe they don't look exactly like this, but you see them in textbooks, right? You'll have these patterns you have these lists of named reactions that say, here's how this kind of functional group transforms into this other kind, or here's this type of coupling. Here's what it requires, and here's what it forbids. And so this is you know, sort of a codification that um, Bartosz Jabowski sort of championed recently in developing the program now sold as Cynthia, where you do define all the rules, and you define all the exceptions and all the conditions, et cetera. And this works but I, sort of starting off on this, was maybe less, less patient, less willing to sort of invest the time in, in devising these heuristics, and at the same time, there's also this notion that chemistry is not so black and white, right? It's, it's sort of diff really difficult to say, well, here's a function group that will never work for this reaction, and here's one that will always work for this reaction. It's a little bit more subtle. 
And so for that subtlety, I, I, we started thinking about how you can learn it from data. And so how do we train models on reactions that we know work um, and teach it, basically, about these rules and considerations? And so in this sort of data landscape in synthetic organic chemistry, um, there's sort of a couple of different kinds that I, that I tend to think about. So we have these commercial data sources and then this USPTO up at the top, which is uh, CC0, which for the most part try to aggregate information from patents and from the published literature. We also have an increasing number of high throughput data sets that are being published with hundreds or maybe thousands of different reactions. Now these high throughput data sets tend to focus on individual reaction types. They're sort of very narrow, you train models on them, but it's with a very narrow domain of applicability. Okay? Whereas if you train models on, quote, the whole literature, right, they see a very broad range of chemical reactions. And so we think about using these sort of first set of models for uh, what are known as global models. So models of chemical reactions that are designed to know about every reaction. But we also think about local models, right, that are tuned and tailored to uh, those specific um, reaction families. So let's look at an example of data that we can learn from. And so for the first part of, of our work in this area, we were using Reaxis. So Reaxis is a very nice resource. They've curated um, you know, this information over the years. We're grateful that they shared the data with us. And if you look at what our typical Reaxis entry includes, right, we have the reactants that are recorded. We have the major or the desired products. And we have some annotations of what additives were used. Sometimes we get the yield, uh, time, temperature, and then some bibliographic information about where this was published. And so this is a, a good amount of information, and it makes perfect sense when our goal is information retrieval and we're searching a database, but there's a lot of information that's missing. So from sort of the input side or the, the setup of the reaction, we don't have concentrations, vessels, orders of addition, and in terms of reaction outputs, there's no records of byproducts, these aren't balanced reactions, minor products, or low conversion or low yield reactions. Those are fairly absent from the database. And so while there's a lot of information that we can learn from here, there's also a lot of information that we don't have that we would like to have. And so what we do really is we cope. We just say, well, let's, let's look at the information that we do have in this nice tabular format and still think about what kind of useful models of reactivity we can build. Okay, so most of what we do is going to be then informed by this type of information, right? this level of detail. So we get back to the task of retrosynthesis. Um, instead of defining these sort of expert templates by hand, what we can do is we can define heuristics and algorithms to help extract them <coughs> automatically. And so in this case, what we can do is we can look at a particular reaction from the literature, this epoxidation, and we can ask our model to analyze the atoms that changed. Right? So it identifies when you prepare this epoxide from the alkene. We can teach it that maybe a little bit of chemical context is necessary, so it includes the neighbors. We can teach it about important functional groups, and so you can define, in the end, a pattern. And so we have this now graph pattern that basically says, well, anytime I see this motif, so this trans epoxide with two aromatic substituents, one idea for the reactants that could make this product is to start from the trans alkene. So we save that, we record it, and we do the same thing for millions of additional reactions. So from millions of reactions, we extract hundreds of thousands or sometimes millions of templates, and then we use these sorts of classification models uh, developed by Marwin Segler, where we train a neural network to look at a product structure and then predict on the basis of that structure which of our rules should be applied. So this is a very large classification problem. We give it the product, and it tells us which rule to apply. In this case, it selects a Suzuki coupling, and so we get the you know, retro Suzuki. Um, reactants if we go in the, the retrosynthetic direction there. And so this approach works and it's, it's sort of the basis of a lot of the programs that we see. It's the basis of our program ASCOS. Um, but template-based methods are kind of limited in terms of their ability to generalize. They're very rigid, right? We're still applying these rigid transformation patterns. And so there's been a number of other approaches taken that are called template-free methods. And so template-free methods try to learn in a more end-to-end -end fashion how to go from products to reactants. And so we sort of think of this as maybe some sort of translation task that's been an analogy used before, where we try to go again from a product molecule to one or more reactants, and the formulations that people have taken for this task vary quite a bit. 
their smiles to smiles architectures, um, which were sort of most recently championed by uh, folks at IBM Zurich, Philip Schwal in particular. There are sort of graph to graph translation approaches that learn how to rearrange bonds in a molecular graph. So make disconnections, add and leaving groups. And recently we sort of had this graph to smiles architecture, which tries to use a graph encoder of the product, and then a smiles decoder of the reactants. And so all you need to worry about for that graph to smiles model is that graph encoders tend to be a little bit nicer for chemistry um, than using sort of smile strings and, and treating molecules as if they're you know, words or sentences. But it is much easier to generate text than it is to generate graphs. And so we use the text generation power of these models instead. So we sort of glue them together and we get you know, a little bit better performance than either type of model alone. Now with sort of any of these approaches, whether they're template-based or template-free, we can start to build pathways. And so we have now these data-driven tools that can plan full retrosynthetic routes to relatively complex molecules. Um, so here's an example, which is fairly old, and I, I keep showing it, and I should update it, um, where in about a minute, we get a suggestion for a 13-step synthesis to make this, this API. Now, it's a fairly linear, flat compound, so maybe synthetic chemists listening are, are not super impressed. Um, but I think it's still convenient to say that, well, in just a minute, right, which is not that long to wait, um, you at least have an idea of one way to start thinking about making the molecule. Maybe some of the steps are imperfect, but at least tells you what you can purchase as well. So it lets you know things like, oh, this whole heterocycle I can purchase, and it's in a pharma sense is a very cheap building block. Um, likewise, you can learn which stereo centers you can purchase versus which ones you might have to build yourself. And so there's a lot of different sort of techniques that we use to sort of constrain this process um, and to influence the search. Uh, so in addition to the sort of classic tree search strategies that have been published in the space, I've also mentioned that some of the overlooked um, research has focused on reinforcement learning as well. So you know, reinforcement learning is this notion of teaching an agent to navigate an environment. It takes actions, it moves through states, and it gets rewards. Well, retrosynthesis is like a game might not be a super fun game, depending on who you are, but it's a game, so we can have these agents learn to do retrosynthetic analysis on their own, and when they find pathways that reach viable starting materials, we reward them, and when they don't, we penalize them. And so we can teach these models to get better and more efficient at this search. Um, and so this is, I think, a very promising direction for making these even faster at finding good routes. Now this is one example highly cherry-picked, because if I'm going to show you one example, it's going to be a good example. Um, but what other people have done in the field is they've looked at wider sets of molecules. And so both Marvin Segler on the left and Bartosz Jabowski on the right have done these sort of blinded comparisons or preference tests with expert chemists. Now, these are just two different ways of visualizing the same conclusion, which is that if you show chemists a pathway from the program and a pathway from the recent literature that was experimentally validated, they largely can't tell the difference and don't express a preference between the two. Now you can get into arguments about whether these were the best targets to use, whether they're the fairest comparison, whether they're too easy or too hard. But I think the fact that you do have situations where chemists can't tell that a route came from a program versus a recent paper kind of indicates that the field is at a turning point. It's a retrosynthetic analysis with computers is really old, right? It's been around since the 50s. Um, not you know, accessible programs, but the idea has been there since the 50s. And the fact that we're now at this stage where these tools are sort of useful in the day-to-day -day practices of many chemists, I think is, is an interesting turning point for us. Now, that, unfortunately, is just retrosynthesis. Right? And if you sort of remember the, the different stages of elaboration, we have to worry about conditions. right? So it's not really enough to say, well, if you want to make this product here, the reactants you should use. You have to know exactly how to achieve that transformation. And so for this, we again start thinking about different aspects of the reaction conditions. First, you know, additives to use, then concentrations, then maybe the vessel matters. You, know, you oven dry it. Do you have to sort of repurify your starting materials? There's a lot of complexity in synthesis and a lot of situations where small decisions matter. Um, so there's all these anecdotes from from people it's often associated with, with org sin, right, the publication where it's like, this reaction worked in a three neck flask if you put you know, the temperature probe in the middle, but not if you put it on the left, right, port on the flask. Right? And there are these reasons why that may or may not matter for the synthesis, but 
there's all of these details that can influence the outcome of a reaction. And so we have to think about how do we start to approach these and how do we start to make predictions of all of these decisions. The first and probably the easiest is condition recommendation where we're just worrying about qualitative conditions like reagents, catalysts, and solvents. So chemists like to call this the above the arrow problem. Um, basically, as you draw the reaction scheme, we know the product we want, we know the reactants we think we can use, and the question is, how do we achieve that? And this is the task for which we actually do have data, thankfully. Right, we go back to Reaxis and we notice, well, yeah, they, they do tell us kind of what conditions were used. And so from a machine learning perspective, I look at this and I say, well, let's create then a supervised learning problem. Right? So what, what you do is you can just mask these details. You, you don't tell the model, okay, what, what was used. You say, well, based on the transformation that was run, what do you think the conditions were? That's how we teach these models to predict reaction conditions. So the model knows nothing about you know, what these chemicals are. All it knows is here's like a list of 1,000 reagents you can use. Here's a list of 200 solvents you can use. Please pick the ones that are most appropriate for my task. And so we, we train it in this way. We train it on millions of reactions. You know, quantitatively, it looks pretty promising. Um, qualitatively, there's something fun that comes out of the analysis because we can actually take the learned representations of the reagent molecules, where, again, the model knows nothing about these. The model just sees this as, okay, maybe LDA is you know, index 20, butyl lithium is index 29. But after we train the model, it learns to recognize their functional similarity. So we just project it down onto two dimensions here with Tisney, right? And at first, it you know, doesn't look like much, but then we manually add the labels of what categories these reagents belong to and we notice that the model has actually picked up on, again, some measure of synthetic similarity and how these molecules are used. So we see, okay, well, it's good that you know, acids cluster, bases cluster, bases are partitioned into organic and inorganic, you know, reductants and oxidants, coupling reagents, so everything is sort of existing in nice little islands. I mean, this model knew nothing about the role of these species. It's only through training it to recommend them that it's actually learned, learned uh, how, they, how they behave. And so this does two things, I think. So one is it's a sanity check, right? As it says on the slide. The second thing is you can start to think about using this to make substitutions. So you could think about you know, trying to enforce some green chemistry principles, recommend functionally similar reagents or functionally similar solvents in different situations if you wanted to bias the conditions in one way or another. So there's, there's a little bit more to this than just a pretty picture, uh, but I do think it's a, it's a pretty picture and an indication that the model is learning something real about chemistry. Okay. Now, unfortunately, that sort of approach to condition prediction is almost as far as we've gotten as a field. So we have some work on quantitative condition recommendation, but by and large, we're sort of stuck at this stage of having a very partial specification of how to run these reactions. Right? And again, these are brand new reactions um, they're not precedents, so we can't just look up what was used exactly in the literature. And that sort of leads me then to a, a big limitation of these types of platforms. And so there's been a lot of work in automated chemistry and, and synthetic chemistry platforms over the years. Um, again, this dates back far earlier than the examples I'm showing here. But while all of these platforms do a good job sort of removing some of the experimental tedium from running reactions, uh, they don't automate all of the planning. And so for these automated platforms, I think one of the sort of secrets that people don't quite talk about enough um, is that the planning is still largely a manual process. Or they're repeating syntheses that we've already run. And so you know exactly what to do because you're not trying to make a new molecule. You're repeating the synthesis of a known one. And that's fine, and that's a perfectly suitable role for automation. Um, but it's a limitation that I think matters when we start to think about autonomous discovery. I mean, that's the eventual goal for me. It's trying to develop platforms that can design their own molecules, test their own molecules, and act on the new information. And so when I think about this workflow of automated multi-step synthesis, there's kind of a lot that still needs to be done. Right? We've got missing precision in the conditions. We also have uh, missing tools for purification and quantitation. Um, but those are sort of separate challenges maybe that we can split off for now. So for, for data-driven synthesis planning, we've gotten part of the way there, but we still have a gap 
it's a pretty substantial gap um, from where we are and where we want to be in terms of automation. Right. We're gonna come back to design because that's one of the main use cases that I care about is designing new molecules and designing new structures that we can easily test and access. And so we're gonna focus on generative models because those are the ones that are a little bit troubling. You know, again, we, we really don't want to accidentally tell our chemist to make this compound or you know, waste, waste someone's time with that. And so the very simplest thing that we can do is we can take these new molecules that have been dreamed up by some machine learning model and we can pass them through our synthesis planning program and we can just ask, is there a route, right? Can we find any retrosynthetic route to these compounds that looks reasonably easy to execute? So this is something that we can do in a matter of seconds, right? We take the list of compounds that have been dreamed up, never reported, and we get some notion of how we might make them. You know, for these six, they all look okay. Again, there's probably gonna be specific issues with the exact chemistries. We don't know the conditions. Many of these might have selectivity problems, but there's at least plausible solutions, right, for how we might synthesize these. That's not universally true. Actually, often what we find is that most of the recommendations from the models, we can't actually plan a route for. So we run them through our synthesis planning program, which we call ASCOS, and ASCOS says, I tried, it's been two minutes, I give up. So one of the sort of longer term solutions that we're, we're pursuing to try to overcome this is to embed synthesizability into the generative process from the beginning. So most of these programs, these sort of generative models, think about creating new structures by modifying atoms and bonds, sometimes fragments. So they do these sort of small modifications and permutations of a structure to try to optimize their predicted properties. But by changing molecules sort of one atom at a time, that's how you end up with weird structures. That's how you end up with those structures that don't make any synthetic sense. And so the approach that we're um, sort of now pursuing um, uh, quite aggressively is to try to teach the model instead to propose a new molecular structure using synthesis as the sort of language for doing so. Right? So we're not gonna build up a molecule atom by atom and bond by bond. We're going to build it up building block by building block and reaction by reaction. So we actually train this neural network model to generate a synthetic tree. So we give it some input representation of the kind of molecule we want to build, and it learns to select from about 100,000 building blocks and about 100 reaction transformations. So we, we teach this model to basically pull chemicals you know, off the shelf and learn how to combine them in order to build complexity and with a full synthetic tree, which gives us then a full product molecule. And so this is sort of how we generate new chemical structures, but force the model to always understand how we might synthesize that product molecule, right? The way that we get the recommendation is through the synthetic tree. And so what that means is that we can train this uh, network to basically recover the product that we put in, and when we apply it, we can use it in an optimization sense. Because if we have this whole network that's conditioned on this input, that means we can give it this new conditional code, right? We can play around with the numerical representation here a little bit. That's gonna give us a new synthetic tree as a result. That new synthetic tree is going to correspond to a new molecule. And so now we can wrap this whole thing in an optimizer, right? So numerically, right, all we're doing is we're gonna say, well, let's change this embedding and try to improve the properties of that molecule. And so this sort of fits into that iterative you know, in silico design cycle that we saw for generative models, this works perfectly well for that. And one of the nice benefits is that if you look at the types of structures that it proposes at this model, you get recommendations that are really small and really simple. That's not true at all if you use other types of generative models that think about atom by atom or fragment by fragment generation, right? They do a great job of optimizing the score we tell them to optimize. This is just a heuristic bioactivity score doesn't mean much. And so these find good scores of you know, 0 0.97, 0 0.95, but you get these structures that of course are syntactically valid but make no sense. Now, the recommendation from the model is very simple because right, we know it has to be synthesizable and actually this is just one step away from one dollar per gram building blocks. And so we have this sort of nice regularization behavior um, that we can rely on here while still getting fairly good structures 
just to illustrate a little bit more what this model is learning how to do, um, this is the result of optimizing for docking score. So we just try to you know, improve the synthesis route, improve the structure to maximize some uh, docking score predicted affinity. So first we know we need to get a first reactant, so the model is going to choose from the list of 100,000. It's gonna pick out the starting material, decides it wants to do an SNAR, that's bimolecular, so it pulls the second reactant. You already see we're gonna have some selectivity problems, um, but that's, that's a sort of secondary consideration here. It chooses then another reaction type, another building block, keeps repeating until it eventually decides it's had enough, right? And so it's going to end in this structure and then say, well, this structure is my final synthetic tree. And then this molecule is what we would score and it's what we would evaluate. I um, mean, in this case, we do all those sort of normal, simple structure-based drug design techniques. We dock it, we compare it to the known inhibitor. Pose looks okay, score looks okay. Um, but this is really just a, a toy task, right? For us to sort of see what the model is learning how to do and demonstrate that we can actually optimize for things like docking score still through the language of synthesis and have these recommendations that are highly synthesizable um, and quite, quite modular and easy to access. Now, this approach to synthesizability constrains generation. It uses building blocks, it uses templates, it uses forward enumeration, and that should be reminiscent, to some of you at least, to these sorts of make-on-demand libraries right, that I talked about before. So this is really how people define these virtual spaces, and it's how people have been defining these virtual spaces for decades. Right? So we've had these, you know, farmers had a lot of internal collections of these virtual libraries and collections for a long time, and it's only recently that we're, we're all getting access to resources like Enemy and Real, and Enemy and Real Space, to sort of see publicly the billions of structures that you get through this enumeration. And so you can think about the generative model we just discussed relative to these kinds of brute force enumerations as having access to the same search space, right? So in principle, the chemical space that's covered by these virtual libraries is the same as the space that the generative model can access you know, with the same number of reaction steps. It's just doing so in a way that doesn't require enumeration. The generative model keeps billions and billions of structures implicit in its parameters, and it just learns how to navigate the space without needing to list all the different candidates and all the different molecules. Now this does require us to predict reaction products, and actually predicting reaction products is its own task, turns out, um, in molecular machine learning. And so we also work on, on this problem. This is sort of just a different model for predictive chemistry, where what we're trying to do is predict reaction products from reactants, sometimes conditions. So here, you know, the input is the reactant molecules, output is the product molecule. We have data. We don't have all the conditions that we would like, but we have millions and millions of published uh, chemical reactions for this. And so there's a number of different approaches that we've taken uh, to do this. So we initially worked on template-based methods, right, sort of the reverse of retrosynthetic analysis. We then moved on to the same sorts of template-free methods. So again, smiles to smiles, graph to graph, graph to smiles. They all sort of apply. You just change what's the input and what's the output. Yeah, but it's the same notion of teaching a model ends to end to predict uh, new molecular structures given the input molecular structures. And so we use this, this type of architecture to validate a lot of our predictions um, for retrosynthetic analysis. So to sort of summarize um, up to this point, the sort of status of, of data-driven synthesis planning, as, as I see it at least, is that we sort of need to consider synthesis when we think about molecular design and the chemical space that we're trying to search. Uh, and that the tools that we use for synthesis planning, which goes beyond retrosynthesis, are actually at a stage where they're useful. Right? And they're being used, I think, in, in most, you know, most companies, most organizations, are at least trying out a few tools. There are many commercial ones at this point. We sometimes hear that you know, routes are used exactly as proposed and they work out, but more often than not, they're used as idea generators. So, you know, chemist gets inspired, they modify it. Maybe there's something that's sort of suspicious about a step, so they change it out. Um, but there's still these, these tools that you can get ideas from in, you know, seconds or in minutes. And so they're, they're already acting as uh, useful assistants in the lab. Now, what they're not doing is equally as important to discuss. And so, um, just to sort of list those out here, right? We still have this gap 
between our recommendation and robotics. We're missing all these details of concentrations, the precision that, that is required for experimental execution. Uh, they're not actually helping us invent new methods. Right? So we're really just applying reactions that we know and reactivity principles that we know to new substrates. They also struggle with small data sets and they also really, they don't replace experts at all. Right? They're meant to support and work alongside expert chemists. Now, in time, we do want to improve the capabilities of these tools, and so there's really two directions that we're trying to take in our research. We're trying to go from these qualitative predictions, let's say of a product species, to a quantitative prediction of its yield or distribution. We're also trying to go from retrospective validation using historical data to prospective validation of new experiments and ideally new reaction discovery. Now, this is going to depend in large part on data. And so just briefly at the end here, I want to mention one of the efforts that I've been involved with recently called the Open Reaction Database Project. So the Open Reaction Database, the ORD, is, is meant to be a resource that sort of spans these different use cases. It's supposed to be sort of a one-stop shop for organic reaction data. We have a, a great governing committee and a lot of support from an advisory board. And really the, the goal, as stated here, is to support this kind of work. It's to try to gather synthetic organic reaction data with enough precision and reliability to train these kinds of predictive models. Now, the benefits, and I think that the use of the ORD is much greater than just training machine learning models. Um, so really what we're trying to do is create the structure, how we think reaction data ought to be structured. Right? It's, it's kind of a shame that most information that we have access to is published in papers and it's really in PDF format. Right? Chemists spend hours and hours making SI documents in Word. They export them as a PDF, and then commercial publishers try to scrape that information back into tables. And so there's sort of this weird loss of structure that I think just creates more time for everybody. And so we, we think a lot about how this data should actually just be structured. It's in its own digital format, natively digital. And there's some benefits, I think, also over traditional ELN uh, in terms of precision. Um, other sort of aspect of the ORD involved, just, you know, searching, browsing the data, uh, making sure that it's freely available. So we, we have everything available under Creative Commons license. And there's also this, this last element of trying to create this sort of cultural shift towards data sharing and chemistry. Um, you know, we can do everything we want in terms of making a database, making it easy, but if people aren't willing to share data, they're not going to. And so we also think about how do we create uh, the sort of the tools and, and maybe the incentives to support this kind of data sharing, both from companies and from academics who maybe sit on notebooks of failed reactions and don't like to release them. Um, so you know, we, we sort of, in the launch, had this sort of large set of data just to show the, the breadth and generality of the schema, um, but really just to, to bring things to a close and leave some time for discussion, I'll sort of resummarize and just mention that you know, the sort of use of machine learning in chemical space navigation is, um, there, there's clear use cases in accelerating virtual screening and in de novo design. There's sort of roles in, in both camps. You know, again, synthesis really has to be a part. If we're trying to eventually close this loop and have this sort of fast iteration of testing the molecules that we design in a matter of days, let's say, we have to consider synthesis from the very beginning. There's a number of challenges we've already mentioned, including low data, universal problem for many of these models, uncertainty quantification and uh, robotic synthesis. And really, you know, we're to blame in part, uh, or rather we're not doing anything to help this so far, but prospective experimental validation is really needed um, for many of these algorithms. And it's, it's not something that's cheap or easy to do, but it is something that the field needs to do um, to, to make progress. So, uh, the very, very last thing I'll mention is how we've just launched a center for computer-assisted synthesis in the US called CCAS. Um, so it's a five-year NSF center, the National Science Foundation. Um, and you can see we've got sort of a pretty, pretty big network of um, academic collaborators. We have a number of industrial colleagues as well, uh, not shown here. Um, but this is a really interesting, I think, group of people to sort of come together and think about the future of computer assistance for synthetic chemistry. So, you know, we have some the proper bona fide chemists here, um, myself not included in that list, um, as well as folks that think about more computational chemistry and data science considerations. So I'm looking forward to, to seeing what we can do in this, in this team.
Now with that, I will bring things to a close. Thank you so much for your time. Um, again, acknowledge people who are really involved in this work and uh, point you to a few review articles if you're so inclined. So thanks very much. Yeah, thanks so much, Connor. Uh, I think we have about 10 minutes or so for questions, right? I didn't have an eye on the, on the clock. Uh, so we'll open it to questions in the room. I see Torsen and Carl immediately raising their hands. So uh, I believe you need to take a microphone so the people will be able to hear you online. Thank Carl. Hi. So very impressive. Thank you very much for, for the um, initiative. Um, there, were a slide, there was a slide uh, with six mm, images of robots. Yes. Um, what about calculating fingerprints for these machines that we have a shorter shortest distance to the routes means that we have a feasibility that can be done most best on exactly this robot. Yes, so I think, I think yeah, we, we do want or need some way of connecting the designs to the robots and thinking about what additional constraints might they impose that aren't reflected in, in the generic plans that we have. So we've, so far the strategy has, seems to be generate retrosynthetic plans, fill in conditions, and then check, does this work or does this not work? But we know for some platforms, you know, maybe the coldest we can go is zero degrees Celsius. Maybe we, we want to avoid any chemistry that requires force. Maybe we know that we can't keep out air, and so we actually get rid of all air-sensitive chemistry. And so those kinds of, of design constraints right now could only be imposed as filters rather than sort of biasing the search itself and getting us closer to um, sort of you know, made for automation routes. Um, but I think the, the first step is really taking those platforms and defining the capabilities to know how that constrains the space of synthetic routes that we need to consider. Yeah. You're great, please go ahead, Carl. Conrad, this, this was a great talk, Thank, thanks a lot. Um, you briefly mentioned green chemistry, and obviously from a process R&D perspective, this is becoming more and more important. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at your presentation, I mean, coming from saying we can generate molecules to, to the experimental limits that we have and ask yourself, is it uh, can we synthesize it? Now, the additional question is, of course, how do we look at it from a green chemistry perspective? So we may want to limit ourselves in terms of solvents, in terms of intermediates, and so on and so forth. Is that something you're actively looking into? Because, I mean, many companies have started working on concepts how to integrate this in synthesis planning. Is that something you look into as well? Yeah, so today there's, there's probably two main aspects that, that we've worked on, and, and we here is, is meant broadly to include collaborations um, back at MIT. So the, the first is, is maybe a simpler evaluation criteria that we can layer on top of these synthetic routes. So again, we have the ability to not just do retrosynthesis, but predict qualitative conditions, including solvents. And so you can use you know, these heuristic solvent classification schemes and say you know, green, yellow, red, in terms of environmental friendliness. And you can then rescore um, those pathways in terms of whether they seem to require solvents that you'd prefer to avoid. Those other, you know, those types of, of reaction level scoring Considerations can be built in also to the reinforcement learning models. So we actually train an agent to then avoid reactions that it believes will require them. And it does get better over time. And there, there's one paper um, that, that I sort of helped a little bit with um, doing that. So one thing is, again, the, the condition level solvents is one that's quite attainable. Um, the other main sort of green relevance uh, work that we've been doing is trying to incorporate biosynthetic transformations as well. So we've um, in sort of collaboration with, with Chris Voigt, uh, who does a lot of SynBio um, at MIT, we sort of have this, this version of ASCOS that has essentially rule sets derived from both enzymatic chemistry and classical, you know, synthetic chemistry, largely non-enzymatic. Um, and what we can do is we can, we can balance those so that depending on the input compound, if it looks conducive to biocatalysis, or, you know, enzymatic production, uh, we can actually naturally favor routes that incorporate enzymatic transformations maybe find some cascades to decrease total step count. Um, but if it looks like we need to do a synthetic step, it also just picks a synthetic step. So we have this sort of hybrid you know, bio-retrosynthetic planning tool that we've also sort of built up around the same infrastructure where we just combine the two information sources. Um, of course, you know, endomatic chemistry has other reasons than just you know, green chemistry, but, but I think that's, that's potentially one of the, the main opportunities here is to highlight those 
highlight those ways to bring in more enzymatic catalysis into traditionally, you know, very uh, synthetic dominated um, routes. Yeah. Yeah, I could also comment. Um, <laughs> um, let's say I, I found really the the marriage of um, retrosynthesis with synthetic con consideration to uh, generative models absolutely essential. So I really like this this approach, and um, I'm curious myself had a question um, about the Turing test, so passing the retrosynthesis uh, software through a comparison to a literature established route and being indistinguishable, at least by grad students, um, yeah. I think you mentioned to some uh, published routes. Um, in this sense, how important are these missing data, so these failed reactions? Do you find that they would add really significant additional benefit to these tools that are already commercialized? Yeah, so, so missing data always comes up as a, as a question, and I think to some extent without the data, it's hard to know exactly what you do with it. So, so one of the, the use cases that we were discussing earlier today, right, is if you do have these clearly labeled examples of, yes, this worked, no, this didn't work, you can train then your classifiers to help say, I suspect this new reaction probably isn't, is falling into the, the failure bucket. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, I think people tend to not appreciate that even in the absence of negative data, right, there's a lot you can still do. Mm -hmm. and, I, you know, and I think about, you know, machine learning as applied to machine translation. It's like, well, you don't really need someone to give you a list of sentences in English and then sentences that aren't the German translation. Right? You just need to have the positive pairings and you can still learn that task and learn that relationship. Mm -hmm. So I think that the role of, of negative examples is gonna be to answer subtler questions than what we're able to answer now. It's to sort of, yeah, get to that next level of assessing feasibility and it's, I think, going to be especially important in predicting uh, things like selectivity. Stereoselectivity is, is something that none of these tools predict well. Mm -hmm. um, and so to, to ask the more nuanced questions, I do think it will help. But I, you know, I've, I've sort of been a little bit pleasantly surprised at how it, it isn't essential. But we would, of course, like to, to see what we can learn from it. OK. And um, so as these tools become more adopted, I'd be interested in your perspective as an academic. Um, in your perspective, do you think the way that we teach organic chemistry will change in the future or should change as these tools become more widespread? It's a hard question for me to answer as a non-chemist. Um, <laughs> organic chemistry was my worst class um, uh -oh. in undergrad. Um, I, I mean, I think it's, I don't know, I, maybe this is going to be a horrible analogy, but you know, if you think about taking a, a driving class, maybe at one point part of the curriculum was learning how to read maps well and, and you know, plan out the path and, and figure out where to go. Mm -hmm. but but now it's really just learning how to execute safely on them. And, and you know, if your GPS tells you to turn into a lake, you just don't do that, right? But you have that sort of sanity check and intuition. Um, I don't know if that's gonna be the same thing for like synthesis planning, right? We, we have tools that are gonna give us routes to many molecules of increasing complexity. Um, it's easy to look up databases of named reactions and, and search for these templates, but there's still always gonna be a benefit of having that on the top of your mind and, and sort of freshly recalled, but uh, it's, I think it's fair to ask what elements of the curriculum will change because the day-to-day -day workflow of, of chemists is changing. So yeah. um, maybe that's a, a non-answer. <laughs> no, that's great. I mean, thanks. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I no, just no. thought it was a, yeah. <laughs> Any other final question from the audience? I think uh, we're coming close to a call. Ah, Torsten, please. Uh, so, me again, sorry. Um, scale up. Um, yeah robustness. So uh, are there any ideas to go in the direction to interrogate proven acceptable ranges so that we have some kind of a, a robustness for that route that we are going to scale up? Yeah, so um, scale is an interesting aspect. So scale is not present in data sources like Reaxis and SciFinder. Um, scale is present in patents data sources. So those, those have been extracted to a large extent. So I think there's an opportunity to annotate source reactions as far as what, what was the scale that it was run at. Um, mm. Now what we do with that information I think is yeah, not, not entirely clear. People have done these correlations. Roger Sale has done this at Nextloop Software. Um, you know, if you look at the yields of Suzuki couplings in the patent literature and you split it into like above or below a gram, you, you see completely different trends because uh, you, just, you have a sort of global effect of scale on, on yields certainly. Um, so I think we, we can think about mining the literature and mining patents to understand what types of transformations have been run at scale before and use that again in some way to bias the search. But I think it's 
in some ways nicer to try to learn, like what is it about a reaction that would make it not scale well? Right? Can we learn, you know, again, sort of sensitivity to mixing? Can we learn exothermicity? Can we think about predicting these more sort of intermediate factors rather than lumping them all together into is this reaction scalable or not? We can sort of dig a little bit deeper and, and try to address the question of, well, why isn't it scalable if we don't believe it is? Um, the same kinds of thing can come up if you're talking about like flow chemistry. It's sort of helpful to think about, okay, well, why is this compatible or incompatible with flow? Maybe rather than just having a, a binary yes, no kind of response. Okay, <clears throat> great. I'd like to welcome Carl to the stage. And also, please join me in thanking Connor for this great lecture. Thank you. So just before we all leave, and please feel free to join us for a drink outside, I just want to mention the reason Connor is with us here today. Uh, Rob alluded to it a, a little bit at the beginning, and he was actually a recipient of an award from the Bayer Foundation uh, last year, so the Early Excellence Award in Science for the Field of Chemistry. Um, now, Bayer Foundation has given awards since 1984, actually, to senior academics, uh, and we have a nice set of alumni, including Christiana Nusslein Folhart, Benjamin List, who won the Nobel Prize last year in chemistry, um, Stefan Hell, and I'm missing one, but uh, we have a fourth uh, Nobel laureate in there. And, and Connor, maybe that's something for your future, not quite yet. <laughs> um, but these awards have been given for a long time. But then in 2010, it was realized that maybe one of the most important groups of people that need to be recognized for their work are the people that are actually changing the way we look at what we do. And that's quite often the breakthrough researchers, the people starting their careers are really stepping up and challenging the existing paradigms of what we do. And it was at this time Bayer established the Early Excellence Awards, and we have them for chemistry, biology, medical sciences, and now also data science. Now I think Connor could have clearly been the recipient for data science as well, but uh, he was actually selected by the jury uh, for the award in chemistry. And we did have an award ceremony in March this year, but unfortunately Connor was defeated by the German airports who all went on strike uh, and was not able to join us in person. So now I would just like to take a minute to hand over uh, to Connor. Uh, first of all, a small token of our appreciation and sort of recognition for your work. And if you could join me in giving Connor a round of applause. And in addition, we have, of course, the formal certificate. Lars, I don't know if we want to try and get a picture. Do you want to try and... Uh, <laughs> but yeah, congratulations to Connor. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, yeah, we're good. Thank you very much. Then. Thank you everyone for joining us, uh, also online, and uh, yeah, a big thank you again to Connor for being here with us today. Thank you. And please join us for drinks if you would like out in the reception. Thanks very much, Connor. Uh, oh, sure.